Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. During the 2014 American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature Conference in San Diego, we brought together a group of editors and bloggers to have a discussion around our brand new Fortress Commentary on the Bible. Their conversation follows in its entirety. Thanks for everybody, everybody for being here. Emily, thanks for organizing this. And Sean, also Sean Tabbitt. Hello. Um, I don't know if you want everybody to maybe introduce themselves first. That would be very great. Briefly and, yes. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, we had a couple of last minute had to cancel and a number of people who had other sessions and things going on and wanted to be here. So it's up to three bloggers here to... Uh, spread the word about what's discussed. Sean's actually doing a recording here. Um, I can blog about it and too. And if we could maybe start with Gail and just uh, quickly do oh, an introduction okay. around the circle, then we'll get started with some of the, the blogger questions. Okay, Gail Yee uh, did, uh, uh, was an editor for this one here, the Old Testament <laughs> one. <laughs> Pew page, same thing. <laughs> uh, David Sanchez, I was uh, an editor for the New Testament. Kimberly Majeski, I'm a professor of uh, New Testament and Christian Ministries at Anderson University. Mm-hmm. Margaret Amer, I'm one of the editors of New Testament volumes. Jim West, professor of biblical studies at Quartzville School of Theology and superstar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can feel right. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. 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 I did quote you. <laughs> 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 oh, great. And I'm Matthew Coomber, one of the co editors of the Old Testament Apocryphal volume. Mike Akeel, I uh, contributed two uh, portions of the Old Testament, uh, Ecclesiastes and Tobit. I know there's going to be a lot of Tobit questions, so <laughs> here it was. Uh, yeah. Would you go? We have I'll talk to you after this. I'm William Ross. I'm a doctoral student at Cambridge. I'm focusing on Septuagint, uh, particularly the Book of Judge, Judges and Lexicography. Neil Elliott, I'm the primary editor of Biblical Studies at Fortress. Uh, Sean Tabak, Community Development Manager at Fortress, and also a podcaster and blogger as well. Scott Tunseth, uh, General Editor for uh, Reference at Fortress. And I'm Emily Barner, the one you've been getting emails from and all of that. So thank you, editors, for all of your help in spreading the word uh, with your institutions and all the contributors' institutions. They were, it was very well received. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a few stories on the, the commentaries coming out um, by, by faculty members. Um, and what I had asked the bloggers to do was just think of a few questions about the process of writing a commentary, the thought behind it, um, your experience doing this project, and um, just some reflections. So uh, if you want to go ahead, maybe Jim, I can ask you to start. And um, we will go as long as we need to. If we, since we have a little few fewer people than we expected, if we're done early, then the editors can get their meeting started early, and it will be a, just fine, right? <laughs> Well, I, I had kind of a basic question, I suppose. Uh, I reviewed the volumes, and I was uh, particularly taken by the quality, in my view, of the Old Testament work. And I liked the New Testament, save the uh, exegesis of Galatians, which I found almost idiosyncratic. And so what I wondered is, is uh, how the editorial decisions were made uh, to determine level of consistency in the quality of the work. Well, I, th- I think we all know reading commentary series, of course, they're always good ones, always maybe not so good ones. Uh, Anchor Bible has <coughs> produced really tremendous stuff until you get to the volume on Revelation, which is just utter rubbish. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking that it must be very difficult to to get a, a level or a certain quality over the expanse of the volumes, and I'm just wondering how you all do that editorially. Are you just asking the New Testament people, or no, no, no everyone? Okay, fine. Yeah, it, because because it's kind of a, a important question to me. How do you decide? Mm-hmm. You know what level to hold people to, mm-hmm. what standards. Gail, do you want to start? Well, well I, I will attempt. Um, 
I mean, I knew what I was looking for, mostly because, again, uh, um, I had to write, I wrote the Ruth and the First and Second Kings, so I knew what I wanted in mind, you know, I mean, I, I understood we had to go from the uh, historical, critical level, uh, the reception history, the interpretation, and, and definitely conte uh, uh, contemporary issues. And I looked at it, uh, what what I want, wanted my stu what I knew about the three levels, and what I wanted my students to know. Okay, and um, I basically looked at and all of my. Well, I should also say, I mostly did the introductory sections to the um, uh, to the the, the the works. I did and I did uh, Exodus and I think Ezekiel, Judith. So those three sections, I primarily did it, held it to my standard, how I understood the three different levels. And especially if, if, you, if I saw some people going over too much historical critical, you know, I said, you need to fill up the middle or the, uh, the contemporary issues. Or um, um, if, if um, contemporary, oh, well, none of them I had, had more contemporary issues. It was for me. It was mostly the historical critical, and I had to give them resources. You know, um, like for me, there were early Christian resources for the different books. There have been volumes, so they could. I just said, go look at that, or else tell them to go look at um, the Bible in in art or literature. I I, I had those resources, so I had. Uh, you need to go into these resources. Go look look here and. So I, I, I would give them, you know, resources for them to look at. <coughs> um, but they, like I said, they mostly, mostly they highlighted the historical and did not go much into the uh, reception history or the contemporary issues. Sure. It sort of, the layout sort of reminded me of the old mm -hmm. interpreter's Bible commentary mm -hmm. with, the, with the, you know, the old mm -hmm. the historical critical and then the interpretive. Mm -hmm. and, and I... I really like the way that you divided it into three sections and included reception, because that's such a oh, yeah. brilliant topic these days. Uh, and I really like that. I really thought it was smart. Uh, I, I had to go look and see if it in Galatians, because I was, I was just curious. And I, know, I now <clears throat> remember who wrote it, and she does have an idiosyncratic take yeah. on it. Yeah. But she's also one of the main voices writing right now in Galatians. So but the... the, 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 the Part of, the, part of the balance we had was to try to find voices sure. that were established and well, well, well um, respected in the discipline, that had an opinion that wasn't every, necessarily everybody's opinion, sure. but was an opinion that would bring people into the conversation, right? Yeah. Um, and regardless of whether or not you like Brigitte's take on, on Galatians, she certainly starts a conversation. She sure does. <laughs> you know, and she does it well. And yeah. she, and what she does better, I think, than a lot of other of the New Testament folks is she really addresses the contemporary well. Yeah. You know, um, but Brigitte has had that, that take on Galatians for several years yeah. now. Yeah. This is this is her thing. This it was for me quite new and quite different right. and, and almost upsetting. Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> because, it was, <laughs> because it was so different than, you know, everything else. I, I think it's fair to say that as we talk about these three levels of interpretation, I'm really curious to to ask uh, readers who were not involved in the editorial process, what's the effect of that on you? But uh, I think Brigitte's essay is one where we can give a briefing saying do these three levels, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to do it the same yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. And she really, I think, did a job in the, the first level, the historical critical sort of level, of bringing her contemporary reading and concern into that level too. Right. Mm -hmm. So she, in a way, she, she didn't if you can imagine direction saying, oh, you must split these into three completely separate <clears throat> levels, she says, in effect, well, you can't do that. If you're a responsible interpreter, you're going to read, and you, she's really up front with what she's doing there. Sure. But I, I can understand, if you're, if you're looking for a real clear break, this is the historical, we're just going to do historical, that, that essay's not doing that. Well, the, the very fact that they're divided into three parts, you know, and, and they have headers, Mm -hmm. It leads to the presumption that that's where the majority of the work will be focused. But we struggle with that ourselves. Yeah, sure, editors. sure. Right. Because, you know, I remember a conversation that 
Gail led us through where, you know, we wondered to what extent does the contemporary setting actually shape right. the questions that you ask about the history of the discipline sure. or about the reception and, and where, how does your location impact what you consider to be the most important mm -hmm. dimensions of the reception history mm -hmm. uh, and who you bring into the conversation. So, you know, do you bring contemporary artists, um, contemporary poets into that conversation because traditional Bible scholarship <coughs> says no. Yeah. Um, but I think it was kind of nice that by having such a diverse array of contributors that in some ways you didn't exactly know what you were going to get. Right. And yeah. <laughs> that actually makes the commentary, I think, worth buying. Right. Because, you know, how many more times do you need a totalizing rehash sure. right. Right. Yeah, between really. those commentaries yeah. that are considered to be the established voices. Sure. And that, going along with both, well, with what all of you are saying, that was one of the exciting things about being an editor on this was that you could see the personality of the people you were editing mm -hmm. and what their priorities were, and you didn't want to squash that. You, know, you wanted to bring that out. But then also to guide them, and it, it, as Gail was saying, they might be going strong towards the historical mm -hmm. or the contemporary yeah. or to the history of interpretation, but to kind of tease it out while still allowing them to be themselves, mm -hmm. yeah, because it's, it's the, the people whom we chose <laughs> we wanted them because of who they were right. and sure those yeah. things forward. And to be fair, the, in, there were a couple of cases where the person who started had to be replaced. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. yes. <laughs> even though we wanted diversity in the way they approached things, mm -hmm. it couldn't be off the rails. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There, yeah. there were a couple of examples where that happened. So mm -hmm. that was a standard that and, we and didn't then on the, the other side is you know, I appreciate that, that you said that the one reading or the one portrayal of Galatians made you uncomfortable. I think a lot of our contributors felt uncomfortable having to think in these three distinct right. areas because yeah. we're trained biblicists right. and for the most of us have been trained to work in, in antiquity. Right. So to force mm -hmm. someone to right. think about reception history right. and then I, I'm not a minister, I, I'm, I'm an academic so then how do I contemporize mm. without trying, I mean, I think a preacher might be able to do that more easily than I can, but then I had to start thinking about the social, political, religious right. ramifications of the text that we were receiving. So I, I really enjoyed walking with, with my contributors through their discomfort. Mm -hmm. and, and the one thing that struck me, and, and I'll hold up one, Michael Beth Dinkler's uh, um, contribution, it was acts that she did, right? Mm -hmm. The command that she had over these three areas, and I was like, I, I was so impressed. Mm -hmm. Because I know where she was trained, and I know what she wrote on, but to be able just to do the interpretive history to the, the detail that she did, um, I found highly impressive. Where others really struggled and said, you know, I've never really thought about the reception history through the medieval period and, and even through the contemporary period. So it was fun watching our contributors' discomfort also, as well as my own. I think I'm appreciative of the approach, um, particularly because I'm not sure um, pastors have a lot of tools mm -hmm. to kind of see all that laid out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we make up the space ourselves or you know, use biblical as an adjective, as if it's this monolithic, right? <laughs> right. So, right. so what I appreciate about um, this project is that it's kind of all in one place. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you know that I struggle with my students is when we teach exegesis, and at my school, um, demonstrating your mastery of <coughs> exegesis is how you pass or don't pass biblical studies courses. Mm -hmm. So m the exegesis paper my students are working on now is worth 200 points. And they can pass everything else in the course, not pass this paper, this project, and they will fail the course. Mm -hmm. That's what heavily, you know. But so you tell people who live in 2014 to do all of this historical critical approach. But, you know, I, I feel like we fail them if we don't also teach um, contemporary issues relating mm -hmm. to the text, mm -hmm. T teach all the different variety of ways a text have been interpreted across history. Mm -hmm. And so, um, really, I mean, this helps us begin to broaden that approach mm -hmm. 
and to ask them to, to include these conversations and this exploration mm -hmm. in their exegetical process, mm -hmm. which I think is a really good and healthy thing. Mm -hmm. So then you're touching on the point that doing the Bible in the 21st century is changing. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's changing, and I think um, that's an important observation. Mm -hmm. I really do. Well, I think oh. this is much more honest than approaches mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we've seen in the past, because mm -hmm. to a certain extent, if you read carefully the footnotes of the classics, if you read the, bio the biographies and the autobiographies, of people that are considered to be foundational scholars in the field. It's mm -hmm. obvious. There's always been a conversation between the contemporary world and the research that's produced, mm -hmm. but it's not acknowledged mm -hmm. in an honest way. And I think this lets you see how scholars can do their thinking in a way that's much more transparent mm -hmm. than it has mm -hmm. been in the past. Oh, one other question. You decided not to include the biblical text in the commentary. Uh, I guess because it would make it too extensive. <coughs> that's, that's the reason. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Too big. If you had, though, if you had included the biblical text, uh, which one do you think you would have used? NRSV, undoubtedly. In fact, we asked the writers to use NRSV oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. as the primary text. And, it, and if they were going to not do that, then we wanted them to know that in the text. Mm -hmm. I have a question, um, maybe more of an observation. I, um, I appreciated the fact that the Old Testament volume also covered the Apocrypha, because I feel that mm -hmm. this is a particularly undervalued portion of reception history, Jewish literature. Uh, again, I'm doing Septuagint, so there's some, some bias on my part. Um, so I was happy to see that. I wondered, however, that there wasn't as much interaction with the rest of Old Testament books in terms of their Septuagint trans translations. Mm. And so you have a you have treatment of specifically <coughs> Septuagint books that are composed in Greek. And um, I, full disclosure, I really only looked closely at Judges, which is my own book, and there wasn't as much interaction with the Greek version of that book as I would have wanted. And I think that's possibly um, also true of the rest of the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's a key that's part of reception right. history that I right. think is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. not only in um, the temp Jewish temple state, but also within the New Testament and even obviously early church community. Mm -hmm. This forms a <coughs> primary interpretive context um, mm -hmm. textually. So I just wondered if, if any of you could comment on that or if I overlooked something in the other Old Testament books. Well, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I'm looking at all of the. The, uh, the books that I've done, and no, you're right. None of the. I mean, uh, I mean, I I did the Second Kings one, uh, first and Second Kings, and I knew I did um, some of the Septuagint for the uh, Jeroboam stuff, but you know, but even when I was editing, you know, the other books, yeah, no one brought, not many brought things up from the Septuagint, and I I'm just wondering if maybe one of the reasons is because you know, we wanted to see these three levels and maybe they thought um, it might be too much historical, but you, you're, you're right. Uh, the Septuagint definitely um, is part of reception history. Mm -hmm. But now, even with, even uh, remembering some of the books that I edited, uh, a lot of went into uh, the Gospels and how how the Gospels, but not not the Septuagint. No, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. and I mean, even even a fairly thorough history of Greek versions. I don't know that even within Hebrew Bible scholarship, that field is sufficiently developed so that we have enough to be able to talk about. No, I yeah, I think you're right. And that's part of the problem in my yeah. in my view. Is that the Septuagint is, is complex enough as its own animal that right. it, it just sort of gets sidelined. Yeah. But it should be. You know, I, I could mm -hmm. very well imagine that if we had a clearer understanding on the part of the, the scholarly receiving public about the relationship, for example, between the old Greek, between Aquila, mm -hmm. so forth mm -hmm. and so on, and yes. how each one of those is a distinct part 
of the reception history. And if we had accessible translations, mm -hmm. as fragmentary as those might be, of each one of those mm -hmm. witnesses, mm -hmm. that we could have a much richer conversation about early Christianity, about early <laughs> Jewish yeah. reception history yeah. and the like. Mm -hmm. But as a side note to that, Jen Aitken of Cambridge is, is uh, publishing a book, a handbook to the Septuagint yeah. Yeah. next year. Nice. So uh, I think it'll address yeah. that very issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also a, sometimes Jim's my advisor, and uh, mm -hmm. he, yeah, the book the book would be very useful, I think, in addressing some of those points of overlap. But there's theoretically an Oxford version coming out, an Oxford handbook as well, although I don't think it's quite as far along. Yeah. As usual, and then there's a Göttingen German handbook also coming out. So there's this proliferation of handbooks that hopefully can fill some of these gaps. Yes. Mike, do you want to speak to being one of the contributors for the, the apocryphal? Well, yeah. I mean, so it's interesting as a contributor, you were all talking about at the thirty thousand foot level. You saw all of this stuff happening as a contributor. You have no idea what anybody else is doing. <laughs> right. You know, right? And so, um, which maybe was was good. I don't know. But it, it was. I would say, the, the first as you were all talking about it, it made me think about how in the discipline right now, and this has been, this is basically all I've been talking about with my friends and colleagues all weekend, is how good we are at separating things from each other. Right. So, you know, we have the reception history session, and we sort of have the historical mm -hmm. critical mm -hmm. sessions, mm -hmm. and those people don't ever talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the volume is particularly, I mean, in a sense, good for the discipline, as you all said, for forcing us to think about things in a way that we often don't. And that, in the reception history is part of that. Obviously, the contemporary is part of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I felt more comfortable in the modern than in the reception history, mm. but that's part of how I was trained too. Right. Um, but I, I, I found the experience to be quite wonderful, and I think uh, quite uh, eye-opening. Even as I think about uh, work that I want to do on into the future, I think I'm going to, and I had never really considered it before, have a reception history component. Mm -hmm. um, now the question will be, how does some publisher think about that? Uh -huh. And and are they going to see that as core to what I'm doing, or uh -huh. is it going to be seen as as ancillary, like it often can be, uh -huh. because it's sort of you don't understand how, well, why, how does it fit, you know? So, but as just it made me rethink what I do and why I do it, and so I I, I really uh, appreciated that. Yeah. I mean, the women's Bible, I mean, I think the field is going more into broadening mm -hmm. out. Like the women's Bible commentary um, also has been including a reception history mm -hmm. for, I mean, you know, how Jezebel is in art or, you know, Ruth is in literature or something. So, I mean, I think the, the field itself is moving into um, uh, looking uh, at the biblical text in a broader way, and then you have that mammoth thing that I think Leon Seau is doing on an encyclopedia of reception history. So I think, you know, I think the field is 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 moving in that in that direction. And within that, what a great time for this to come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah great time. I hope you guys make a lot of money. Well, well, I hope we get a lot of royalty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so it'll, they work together. it'll be mutually beneficial. <laughs> <initially. laughs> no, no. I'm interested in, as, as somebody involved in Fortresses, bringing an editorial team together to then bring contributors together. I'm really interested that we're again and again using this phrase reception history, which at an editorial meeting two years ago, we sort of all agreed we're not doing reception history. So I just want to okay. notice. Okay. There, there are two different things. One of the conversations, and I was really okay. impressed with the way you all formulated this, because it came from, from you, mm -hmm. that um, one way of doing commentaries traditionally is to say, here's all this work historically critically to say, that's what the text meant, period, we're done. It's this fixed thing that's then going to travel through history as a little package <laughs> and handed like cargo from mm -hmm. one group to another until it lands on your doorstep today. Mm -hmm. So reception history is all the people who touched it on the way, look at their mm -hmm. fingerprints. Mm -hmm. But we had talked about this, no, that's not what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're trying to explain how did we get from this ancient text yeah, that is to modern mm -hmm. 
a variety, mm -hmm. proliferation of readings and interpretations, mm -hmm. so that history is a way of saying, look how this changes over time. Right. In effect, saying it's not the Gospel of John being passed on. The Gospel of John in each successive century is a yes. different thing. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where I think the, the analogy of the interpreter's Bible is it, it's, it's not precise, because mm -hmm. this is, it's not doing the fixed ancient thing and then what happens later, which often in the, the theological tradition becomes, uh, look at all the people who made mistakes until we came along to correct them. Right. Okay. And this is, that's a very <coughs> specific sort of orientation we tried, uh, I think successfully as a as front team, to avoid, to, to um, communicate the, the idea that there's one, there's not one right reading today <coughs> that everything else right. can be compared right. to. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And then I think that the, the, the gift of, of the most contemporary part of the section um, is that we were trying very hard to in, in, invite the reader into a conversation and invite the reader to be the next level of, his, of reception, mm -hmm. the next receiver, the next interpreter. So you, you've seen the context out of which this came and how this text has changed over time as it's come to you. What are you going to do with it? And situating that question within a context of um, this is what's going on around us, and this is how this text is used or interacts with this is what's going on around us. Mm. So the shame that, that Obama's speech on Thursday happened before the commentary came out. <laughs> this wonderful thing about being a stranger, you know, mm -hmm. quoted by the President of the United States on television, the lovely Hebrew Bible commentary on, on the whole I was a stranger and and and. Um, so what are you going to do with it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, I like that invitation, and I like that approach. I I wanted to ask a question. We're I, I've been um, working in our own tradition on a. We're trying to do a Wesleyan Bible dictionary. And what we found is what I'm sure you found is that location has everything to do with how you interpret. Um, certain topics and text mm -hmm. and material. So I'm wondering how you dealt with that. Did you just sort of let it be, wh whoever this person was, wherever this person was, in terms of um, uh, bringing forth that study and in in, in their own interpretation, their own experience? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Or did you try to set some parameters for um, a consistent approach or at least an identification of particular biases or beliefs mm -hmm. that are ascribed to certain location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had one contribution in particular in which the contributor had a very <coughs> definite view on how this text relates to the modern world and was very following a very um, definite school of that. Mm -hmm. And I definitely wanted that to come through from that contributor, but I also want to say, look, there's these other schools of thought, mm -hmm. and those need to be addressed as well. So uh, it's that balance between having something that is true to what's being talked about on the street, but at the same time looking at what's going on a block down on the street, you know, getting those different voices in there. So there were a couple of occasions where I did have to guide into, well, I know you're very passionate about this, but we need to also look at what these other people are saying about the text. So that's yeah. one instance in which I came out. <clears throat> Similarly, I, I was somewhat, um, certainly in the New Testament volume, the ones I, I, I edited, I'm conscious to remind folks in places where texts had a particular resonance with people of color, because sometimes white interpreters can sometimes not hear the ways in which um, a particular text skews in a particular community. Because, mm -hmm. as you said, location matters, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. if location matters, then where you're reading from matters. And there are particular texts in the New Testament um, that have resonance with women, have resonance with, with people of color, have resonance with certain uh, issues that, you know, if, if they're not being addressed, um, the reader of that text is going to wonder why it's not there. Mm -hmm. A particular mm -hmm. community reading that is mm -hmm. wonder where's my voice. That was something I wanted to just kind of reminded me. Um, again, I've kind of focused on judges when I was <coughs> reading and reviewing, um, <coughs> and I wondered, in the course of reading it, whether the editorial board had influence over which portions of the book were focused on. 
in the author uh, in the author's presentation. Uh, I I find Judges to be a highly literary and yet highly political book, and so. I was happy when I read some of the modern applications uh, in terms of politics and, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth, but there were some parts that I was surprised uh, were not included, particularly the Deborah narrative, uh, because it seems to be sort of just shouting to be treated uh, in terms mm -hmm. of modern applications. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't uh, that wasn't treated at all, and so and there's plenty of stuff in judges uh, mm -hmm. that's sort of this alarming stuff that calls to be talked about. Um, I so mean, I edited the, I edited that one, and I know the author, um, and I don't remember. I mean, because Deborah would have been something I would have been familiar with. So I'd, I'd have to personally go back and see yeah. see what was. I mean, are you thinking from a feminist perspective? <coughs> or, uh, all, yeah, all sorts of things. Okay. Like polity, politics, okay. feminism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it was on my mind. I just had read. There's a uh, Joy Schroeder just published a book called Deborah's Daughters, in which she treats mm -hmm. the whole reception history of mm -hmm. Deborah. So I was looking to see if it was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing the thing is, I mean, for at least for both first and second kings, I only had eight thousand words. Right, and mm -hmm. and, and we had to do thought. three different <laughs> yeah. levels, yeah. and so yeah. um, I mean, and the person who did do judges had already done a, a, a lot of work on judges and a, a commentary on judges. Yeah. So he made specific, right. you know, choices. Of course. And uh, we all made choices, but, you know, uh, what, the, what that's you what yeah. yeah, and I and I, that's kind of what I was asking, that you have to make choices. You, you only yeah. have so much room. Mm -hmm. right. But what's important is that, you know, this large sweeping, a representation of, of large sweeping you know numbers of communities are represented mm -hmm. because if I don't see my voice in, in our particular uh, book that we're working on um, someone wrote uh, Prisca see wife of Aquila that was an entry wow um, so, oh, oh God! <laughs> oh, right, I want to die when I see that. Yeah. Uh, right, right, and so, right. I mean, that's the thing: is, mm -hmm. is um, it, what was the process of balancing those, mm -hmm. you know, decisions so that you could make sure mm -hmm. that diverse sampling of communities mm -hmm. were represented, so that mm -hmm. we hear our voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part, of, part of it starts with who you choose right. and who you recruit. Mm -hmm. So I think these editors have a sense had a sense of what they were getting into a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe not always um, when when somebody was invited. Mm -hmm. So it kind of starts there. The constraints of size really mean we have to make these hard choices. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with this? Mm -hmm. And the way you talk more about the um, inviting. The, I think you used the word student, I don't know, but inviting the reader, reader into being part of this communication. Um, <coughs> part of this was literally to imagine a reader who is a student right. and mm -hmm. is yeah. being drawn in, not just to say, mm -hmm. all this interpretive work has been done for you, you just get to receive it, mm -hmm. but to say the interpretive thing is going on and you're invited into yeah. that. Right. What we don't know yet, because this has just come out, yeah. is how is what's the effect in a classroom? How does this right. get used? How can it be taught? Mm -hmm. Can it be taught? Is it too big, too little, too much, mm -hmm. not enough? So I'm I'm really curious, maybe in a year, to have a conversation like this and find out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how does this work. I think the cool thing about it is that it invites you to ponder the mysterious aspects of commentary as genre. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I, in another project in the Africana Bible, we actually had people be very specific about their location, <coughs> autobiographical mm -hmm. statements. Mm -hmm. These are much more standard, they're very concise, but they still invite you. Where's this person from? Every commentary invites you to ask that question. But then the, the three-level commentary actually invites, it, it challenges you to ask, for example, in section B, are these all the voices? Right. If not, the voices are there. Yeah. how were they chosen? Mm -hmm. And why is their representation by this author on this book significant? Mm -hmm. Are these all the contemporary issues? Well, mm -hmm. no. 
Yeah. Where do mm-hmm. I fit in the conversation? Mm-hmm. So I think you're absolutely right. It'll be really, really interesting to see how people talk with the commentary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I instruct my students which commentaries to use. Right. I mean, I I say use these for academic study for the purposes of this project. So I mean, I, I definitely think this is a tool that will be something that I add to that um, because it offers this next piece that I, I feel like it has been missing from. You know, I love the word biblical commentary series. Um, I particularly love Annie's Revelation um, um, volumes, but. It, it's exhaustive and it's wonderful and it's deep and I love that. But then, but then that extra step to push out into mm-hmm. contemporary contexts mm-hmm. is really needed. I think mm-hmm. it's redefining the genre of commentary mm-hmm. um, because, as you mentioned, I only mm-hmm. and he was anchor Bible, right? No, word biblical. That's right, word biblical. Mm-hmm. I mean, what what we've done here is is so different than that project. First mm-hmm. of all, I mean, his was three volumes, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Um, ours is much more concise, but, you know, I was thinking, going back to something Neil said, you know, this whole project challenges this notion of of sola scriptura and, and the whole Protestant project of, of correcting right. tradition. And in some ways, traditional commentaries have been that sola scriptura moment to correct the history of interpretation. Now, this is going back and challenging that. So for me, this is a really postmodern moment. And and who are the authoritative voices? And what if we have more than one authoritative voice? And what if we even challenge the notion of these authoritative voices never agreeing with each other anyway? So it, it, it's almost a, a nice moment. It, it's a Rorschach test of, of the commentary genre in that, you know, what are we projecting onto commentary? So I, I, I think it was an interesting project in that way. And with that, and with also doing something new and kind of breaking <laughs> from the traditional mold, mm-hmm. I'm the only white male on the editorial team, and I really like that aspect of wow. the project. That's true. That's yeah. new. We had one, one white male and one white female. Yeah, yeah, and that's a real break from the history yeah. of who's yeah. control the conversation of biblical mm-hmm. studies mm-hmm. and the interpretation. Mm-hmm. In fact, the New Testament volume is, is, is edited by two, two people of color and a white woman. Well, we're uh, yeah. so same with the Old Testament. No, but, oh. no, but you, you, have, you know, the, the, the majority of SPL is white men. Oh, okay. So we don't, we don't even have a white man. We don't have a white man commenting on Je- uh, editing the volume okay. on Jesus. Oh, okay. But for the Old Testament, all of us are Episcopalians. Yeah, that's not the case. Over <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's not. A, in fact, I think Cynthia is the only Episcopalian on this side. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. three of us. <laughs> the rest of us. David's Roman yeah. Catholic, and yeah. I'm a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> As an Episcopalian, I want to make it very clear that wasn't an intentional. <laughs> As a Lutheran, I was just depressed. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Oh, can I just? Uh, it would be interesting to see what the book reviews, you know, yeah. that come out on this. Because I am sure we're not going to please every everybody or anybody or whatever. I don't know. It's just I mean, just listening to the conversation. Oh, you didn't put this in. You didn't. Put, you know. I mean, what? You know. It's just. It'll be interesting to see. It'll be kind of like a Rorschach test. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Really. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the volumes ended up being about 400 pages total, longer than we started oh, out really? with. So oh, gosh. we didn't completely put the reins on everybody who wrote. Right. <laughs> but sure. so that that tells you something about where we thought we were going to be. 400 pages? Dag. Yeah, third volume. (laughs) Yeah. That was all on your side. (laughs) (laughs) Actually not. They really were all over on the new side. Two two thoughts. One, uh, to push the idea, it it doesn't only just change the notion of what a commentary is, it changes the notion of what exegesis is. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I, up until a month ago, um, my provost, who was educated at Harvard back in the 80s, uh, was railing that you know some of the stuff we're doing isn't exegesis, it's hermeneutics. And we need um, not to be teaching them ex hermeneutics, yeah, which is a false, what the whole nation of this commentary is, raises that as a false dichotomy. <laughs> The, the way this commentary right, right. is structured mm -hmm. says that's not even a com that that's that's not a real conversation anymore, and we've got to not have that that false dichotomy as if that false dichotomy really truly exists, mm -hmm. because that is in fact a way to determine whose voices are true and whose voices are not true, right? Mm -hmm. in, in that sense, and then you ask the basic question: Who chose the the, the, the structure of the commentary? Well, the, the authors did initially. The, there was a two-step process. They, they, they came to us first with, we had them give them an out, us an outline and a sense of where they were going. Do you remember? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it was yeah. a thousand years ago. A thousand yeah. years ago, the world was very young. But we had them give us a, 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 an outline and a sense of where things were going and a sample mm -hmm. of, of one section. And we, we commented on that. And we might have said, oh, you need more of this here or that, or some more of that there. And then they went to it. And then part of our job was to nag them to make sure it got enough time. <laughs> but so to, to some extent, we gave some of that, those um, choices, those, those exegetical and hermeneutical choices, to the authors themselves. And so even the question of what was left out and what is left in is a, is, is a question, as Hugh says, about this author. Mm -hmm. Well, what is it about this author that he or she does not see this as a critical sure. question? Besides page length. Yeah. <laughs> but it is also true that in that dialogue back and forth, some of those outlines changed. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. had suggestions for people, oh, and, oh, yeah. and they expanded or contracted or whatever it needed to happen. So there was, there was a dialogue about that. And it was important to, to have your perspective at the press involved in the conversation. Yeah. Because I remember a couple of instances, you know, for example, with the book of Sirach, yeah, where, so. you know, the author says, well, you know, no one agrees that the book has a defined structure. <laughs> Can I treat it genre by genre? Do I have to go serially in order? And, you know, thinking about consistency within the overall presentation mm -hmm. of each book, along with what specialists in the discipline have said about the book, along with what makes the most sense for doing what we consider to be really important with every book, you know, you just how you make an informed decision to go forward, that was really, I found it really instructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Psalms, too. Psalms was one. How do we approach this? And Derek Superman, I think, did a wonderful job, but the, but the help from Fortress on that, on getting that going in the, in the dialogue between um, uh, Suderman and Fortress, that was, it was really fun to watch from the editor's chair, and it's how it's all unfolded. Mm -hmm. For the benefit of our recording, I wonder if each of the editors could c comment a little bit on the introductory portions that they wrote or commissioned mm -hmm. for okay. the commentary. Um, sure. Because that's obviously a piece that's of significant value to students as well, those um, highlighted elements of the collections and such. Mm. Well, I, I mean, since I did a lot, you know, uh, that was the main, and I don't know how I ended up with it. <laughs> uh, I mean, because, I mean, I um, I edited the um, Daniel Smith Christopher reading the Christian Old Testament, Norman Gottwald's themes and perspectives in historical writings. Oh, and Sarah Sheckman's uh, the Torah and pro writings and pro so I had all, all you know, uh, Torah writings, um, historical books, and um, and the Apocrypha. I had the that in, and so I had actually I had all the introductory ones. Uh, the I had the Torah with Sarah Sheckman. Uh, Gottwald's uh, historical writings, Tim Sandoval's uh, for wisdom, Carol Dempsey for prophets, and so I had all the introductory ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your question was, hold on, what was your question? Well, how were they chosen? Oh, and oh. And just comment oh, okay. on the process of working with the authors. Oh, on okay. Those. Um, all right, I'll tell you about 
particularly Gottwald, all right? I was supposed to be doing the introductory section to Gottwald, okay? And um, um, he was supposed to be doing First and Second Kings. And he, I, so I said, so I, I, in dialogue, oh, you're doing the commentary on First and Second Kings. Oh, no, I've never done a commentary on First and Second Kings. So we traded. So, <laughs> so that's what I mean. <laughs> so that's how I ended up with First and Second Kings. All right, that's how I ended up with First and Second Kings. And he ended up with the historical books. Uh, Sarah, I was looking for somebody who understood Torah. Um, and she became very highly recommended by... I, I don't know anything about Pentateuch. I mean, all that, you know, all that, the, the latest stuff. So I asked uh, particularly friends of mine, in fact, Tom Dozman, some suggestions. And I, I, I went in and tried to figure out who, who has done Pentateuch. And she did a very good job, I felt. Um, Tim Sandoval, uh, he was not the original one that was going to be in it. Um, uh, but I know his work, uh, um, asked him, and he did a, r a really good job as well. Um, let's see, Eileen Schuler, again, very well known in Apocrypha. Uh, Carol Dempsey, also known in, in Prophet. So it's people who I knew already have done um, uh, uh, work in those areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And several, several of the editors here also did one of the yeah. major articles. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could talk about yeah. your own experience with those. And uh, yeah. well, well, in, in the New Testament volume, the Quach Bunan is probably one of the best mm -hmm. um, biblical critics of the contemporary world. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to describe who she is. She's a biblical critic of the contemporary world. And she does a really nice job of reading the Bible and reading the contemporary world together. And so, you know, not too easy, mm -hmm. but we got a wonderful, we got a wonderful essay from Dr. Doc, from Doc Um I don't remember who did Lawrence Mills's. Was that you or was that Cynthia? I don't think that. That'd be Cynthia. That'd be Cynthia, okay. But um, two of the essays are actually David and me. Um, Mine was supposed to be the introduction to the Hebrews, James, First Peter, John part of the, the, the commentary. And I had the, the temerity to, to raise the possibility that rootlessness was not simply something that was a piece that was only with the Hebrew, Hebrews, James group, but that this was endemic and part and parcel of the whole way in which New Testament um, and New Testament books are writing. And so this is something I've been thinking about for some time. And so we ended up moving that essay from where it was mm -hmm. to the front of the volume. And then Neil stepped in and wrote a, an introduction to Hebrews, James and First Peter, because David insisted, no, this, is, this needs to be up front. This, because David edited my piece, and I think I edited your piece. <laughs> um, this needs, this needs to be up front. This needs to kind of give us a, a, a bigger overview. So the initial plan of where things were supposed to go sometimes got shifted um, based on what ended up being written. Um, Demetrius Williams, um, I'll let David speak about his own thing. Demetrius Williams uh, was the commentator on Acts in True Native Land, which is the African American Bible commentary. And having Michael Beth Dinkler do Acts, which is, she's brilliant. Um, but then not to have an African-American voice and some of the texts that are so critical to the African-American mm -hmm. contemporary context meant having Demetrius in there did a nice, was a nice balancing voice. You wanted to have a person of color with some of the texts that are so very central to some of the liberationist movements. You can't do Romans without Paul. Oh, Neil Elliott, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> you can't do Romans without okay. Neil Elliott. You can't do Paul without Neil. So <laughs> Neil's taught everybody how to read Paul. So those are some of the um, essays. I didn't do them all. David, you want to talk about yours and some ones you did? Well, it's interesting. I didn't realize that you and I went through the same process of saying that our contributions. I did Apocalyptic Legacy. Yeah. And I, I, I spoke to, to Scott and Neil, and I said, you know, one of the things I want to do is, is I want to talk about the legacy of apocalypticism being greater than the book of Revelation, or right. the Apocalypse of John. Mm -hmm. And to have that introduction right in front a revelation was locating revelation as the focal point of apocalyptic tradition. And if you if you read my piece, 
I, I really argue for reading the Gospel of Mark yes. as, as an apocalyptic hmm. gospel. Therefore, I needed to get I needed to get that apocalyptic legacy at the beginning to flavor everything that we read. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think just from a logistic perspective, moving the introductory uh, um, article that I wrote to the front allowed people to have apocalypticism on their mind as they read through the other pieces, as they encountered Mark and they read our Mark contributors piece um, hopefully thinking of some of the things that, that I contributed. And, and it's interesting because in, in my piece I also mention why Mark isn't the first gospel. Uh, uh, because then you would end up with an apocalyptic inclusio beginning with Mark mm. and then ending with Revelation. Therefore, I, I argued that it was quite brilliant for the fourth century editor who put Matthew in front to, to make the apocalypse now at the very end, the culmination of the church that began in Matthew. And by the time you get to Mark, you have, you've already been saturated with the ecclesiology of Matthew that Mark just becomes a part of Matthew. And, and you don't read it apocalyptically. So uh, I think where we place things is really important both in the canon and in our commentary. Well, so. that answers some questions actually for me as I was pulling the materials together and learning on the commentary to why there were so many introductory things to this New Testament. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Oh, on, on the Old Testament, I remember so <clears throat> agreeing to, uh, to to do the reading the Bible in the ancient modern context, reading the Old Testament. And uh, I remember being excited about this, then I went back to my hotel room, I thought, oh, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's so much, and I, I was thinking, well, the same thought I had when I started my dissertation. Uh, if I could have a magic lamp right now and make one wish, it would just be to see the outline, the table of contents, like how am I going to approach this? And I knew what I wanted to do was really highlight for the readers, um, for those who might not have engaged with this, to introduce them to it, for those who have, as a reminder of how complex the Bible is. Um, I think a lot of readers of the Bible kind of view the Bible in the way that in Islamic tradition, the Quran's view that God dictated, or Allah dictated this to Muhammad and it was written down. But, Going through all the different variables, you've got the political settings, and not just one, but no, no. centuries of evolving political studies. You've got religious settings, you've got <coughs> economic settings, you've got the weather having a major <coughs> impact on, on these texts. And so exploring these from different angles and showing that complexity, and how complex the ancient world is, but it's not just the ancient world is complex, our world is complex. And, and I mean, I could say, you know, United States, California is complex, 21st century, but then you got 21st century India, um, China, and then all the centuries going back. So how these things then are received into environments that, um, fun I, one of my uh, things I kept on the forefront of my mind as I was doing this was, I think it was Martin Luther, who said the Bible is a constant, is a living book because every generation rewrites it. And just kind of introducing these themes to, to the reader was, and it was a joy. I, I got to uh, delve into so many areas. It was, it was a very fun process, but an, an intimidating process to be sure. Mm -hmm. I had the same feeling, it just abject terror. <laughs> the people of God and the peoples of the earth. <laughs> God. God. Just a really small topic. <laughs> yeah. And a good experience. Go. Yeah. 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 But you know, I, it, life. I think I made a conscious decision about everything that I contributed to the book, whether it was choices of editing. I mean, my area is early, early Hebrew poetry. If it happened in the exile, generally, I'm not as interested. And so, editing all or a goodly portion mm -hmm. of the apocrypha mm -hmm. was um, it was kind of it was it was an exercise in um, professional discipline <laughs> that precisely because these were were books that are not my forte but which I recognize as being important and so in writing the introductory article my challenge was to disengage from every other article about peoples of God and people of the earth that I had ever seen before. And writing this in a, in a way that reflected my own training as a philologist, my dabblings in the area of anthropology and a research associate for human relations, area files, and 
thinking about things that I had taught, like about the UN Declaration for Human Rights, mm -hmm. and also um, being in conversation with the madness that goes on at times in, in our own church. And, you know, writing, you know, the concluding section and saying, you know, maybe the Bible shouldn't be the only conversation partner that we have when we think about the nature of humanity. Uh, it was really recognizing that you're a part of a, of a long tradition where people are thinking about the nature of humanity and putting enough space between you and what, what everyone else has said mm -hmm. so that you can actually say something that is a new contribution. Mm -hmm. And that working within it, that this, this openness that the Bible presents isn't a thing that shuts down the Bible. Because some of my students uh, will <coughs> take it that way. But this is something that really opens up the Bible. It, 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 the Bible not as, is, a, is a book that dictates to you, but a book that it starts conversations. Right. And when you have all this diversity within the text, you can realize that, wow, the conversation can just fly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to get back just momentarily to something several people, several editors have talked about. The, uh, this being a different kind of commentary and mm -hmm. challenging the kind of genre of what a commentary is. I thought it was interesting when we finally got the, the marketing materials together and looked at endorsements without naming names. Two of the endorsements, one endorsement comes from a scholar prominent in the discipline who has sort of made a career saying, don't trust commentaries as such. They're suspicious, avoid them, they're, they're problematic. Another uh, endorsement comes from a scholar who I consulted early in the process saying, um, if, if you could have just one commentary everybody in your institution would use, what would you want it to look like? And he said, that's a ridiculous idea. I would never do something like that. There's no way you can put the kind of things an educational institutions need in one a one line commentary. You can't do it. And he's, this is an endorser of the mm -hmm. so I, uh, something happened in putting this together that really kind of brought attention from people saying, this is new, this is uh, worth our consideration. Which makes me want to just congratulate the editors for exactly. making this happen and the contributors. Yes. Well, I mean, I think it's also to be, the, 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 the press itself is to be congratulated for the, the imagination even start this process because we didn't we didn't come to the press and say we have an idea for a commentary the press came to us and said we have an idea for a commentary we want you to edit <laughs> you know but there was a dialogue about it was it was there was there was but there, well, there is something to be said for the, the the imagination and the vision of fortress press <laughs> in doing this well i i got on to the thing primarily because I wanted to concentrate on the contemporary issues part. And I thought this was the commentary on the contemporary issues part. And then I found out, what do you mean historical, you know, interpretation, you know, and contemporary. I remember and then, that kind of right, and, <laughs> and I wanted the big part of the 60% for the yeah. third, <laughs> you know. And, um, and then you guys said, uh, so then you gave us a range, which, all right, so, but that then I, helpful. pardon me? Oh, that was helpful. I really yeah, right, 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 right. having those percentages for... And um, I, going through this, um, knowing that my, my, um, my, a lot of my people were concerned about, the, they had a hard time with contemporary issues, and so they were probably glad that we, they had that range there, but I do, I do remember thinking that we were writing a commentary focusing on the third third level mm -hmm. and we had to go do these first and second levels <laughs> so well and, and we have not been trained to think about the contemporary right we have been challenged to leave the contemporary right. out mm -hmm. yes uh, hence that dichotomy of exegesis and eisegesis mm -hmm. which i think is a false dichotomy mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and interestingly, you're, you're training people. Well, not always. I mean, in college setting, not necessarily, but in a seminary setting, yeah. you're, you're training them to do level C. Yeah, okay. and, you know, it's, just, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's an interesting challenge. Well, and it's interesting because Vincent Wimbush writes in his African American Bible text that we are training uh, mutes in seminaries. Mm -hmm. and, and, <laughs> and I think that's interesting because basically what we're, what we're what we have historically trained people in historical criticism is to silence their own voices theoretically, mm -hmm. which is never has never been the case. Mm -hmm. But that has been what we have projected. Mm -hmm. 
and and I think I agree with Hugh very much when he says this is dishonest. Mm -hmm. This is this isn't saying that we do bring the peace to this, mm -hmm. and and I'm not quite sure I like it that we call the last portion contemporary readings because I think we just fall onto the tradition. Mm -hmm. We're part of the tradition. We're just another traditioner mm -hmm. of a long set of traditions. And I like Neil what you said. We're not handing the Gospel of John in its perfect form to mm -hmm. moment after moment after moment. We're all reconfiguring John. And so, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I think Vincent is right. You know, traditional semi seminary education does tend to mm -hmm. encourage you to be completely mute. And then you go into a congregational setting mm. and you can't you do anything. Say. You've got to rediscover your imagination and mm -hmm. your voice. And I think a commentary of this kind really does put the imaginative process front and center and suggests that this has always been a part of how the tradition has been constructed. Right. And that we should own our active role in it. And to recognize that as soon as you abdicate that, it's a kind of spiritual death that mm -hmm. you want to go and that the tradition begins to undergo. Mm -hmm. And historically, commentaries have been almost as authoritative as the scripture itself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And when exactly. you think of, say, the Hermeneus. Oh, my gosh. That's exactly the, the one I thought about, or the anchor. But, or the anchor but. Right. I mean, I'm just thinking of, of the Q volume. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm thinking about hans Dieter Betts Galatians volume. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Or even when you look at Early, the tradition of early Jewish commentary, if you go back to <coughs> the back of Pesha, you know, where you've got the text is hedged by the commentary or by the Talmud. The text is hedged by the commentary. And, you know, we've disentangled the processes, mm -hmm. but, you know, you look at the size and scope of, Her of Hermeneia volumes, and if you look at the the balance of commentary in something like the Anchor Bible. Wow, you know, it's pretty clear that the tradition goes in the suitcase with the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like, I, I'm uh, involved with the Hermeneia commentary series, so I don't look at it. <laughs> but it is a, it is a particular kind of project. And and still and I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I have seen the Herme Hermeneia and live. Um, that there's something about the the appearance of exhaustiveness that everything that oh, needs yeah. to be said yeah. is yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. that means they become larger and larger. And I've, I've heard people say, obviously, any kind of commentary is a decision, a set of decisions. Mm -hmm. But to try to be exhaustive also means you're being exhaustive verse at a time, and it becomes the more trees you put in, the harder it is to see the forest. Right. Yeah. So you you begin to lose a sense of the overall document, the overall impact, the, the message as such. So I think that it's an interesting, I really appreciate the, the groaning and the whining all through this process about page count. <laughs> I mean, we, it's a really artificial thing to do, yeah. to say, make it, make it fit in that book. But that also means you, a reader, can spend an hour and get <coughs> really involved with the book right. of the Bible. Right. We also wanted to be out by this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's that was a consideration. It's a kind of yeah. Leaping and gnashing the teeth. Well, you know what's interesting is when you, again, and I, I really appreciate the Hermeneia series, and I should say I that. Sure. Um, but I think we go to the Hermeneia series for answers, and, and perhaps we go to these now for questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. That's a nice point. Well, and I, I think there, this is like a, a some place in between. Um, what, what's it called? The, the pastor's preaching commentary and the and Hermeneia, right? This is this is that space that hasn't been celebrated. I think. In the pulpit commentary. That's what. That's a good point about going to Hermeneia for. For instance, I mean, yeah, in some ways, you also, I find myself going to, for example, the Anchor Bible oh, so. commentary mm -hmm. so for personalities. So people we were hate Don Hood's Psalms commentary. Oh, sorry, I think it's just the, just the, the most imaginative, oh, okay. over-the-top commentary that one could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. You know who he is. 
you know he sees everything through a particular lens, and it has value precisely for that reason. Or you go to Matthews, because you know that Albright's way out of his range, and yet you want to you want to engage it just to see it's a theory. So, interesting. Thanks for listening to the discussion on Fortress Commentary on the Bible. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 024. Fortress Press Live is available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, and YouTube, so be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. This is the final episode of Fortress Press Live that I'll be hosting and producing. Thanks so much for listening to the first 24 episodes. For the last time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.